Your voice, your opinion, your community. Fact TV, free speech, protected. What rating do you give a movie based on kids' books? What season does this movie take place? And what's in the bag? All this and more in Gory Storytime. Warning. Gory Storytime is a horror movie review show by a son and his dad who thought that letting his five-year-old watch scary movies was acceptable. If you are offended by horror or talk about blood and gore by a child, or if you don't want horror movies from the 60s through today spoiled, then there is a remote stuck in your couch cushion next to potato chip crumbs. Use it. And of course, parental discretion is advised. Why? You didn't use any. Shut up and start the show. Story time. I'm your host, Jason. I'm his co-host and his father, Craig. And just to quickly answer those questions, PG-13, The Season of the Witch, and Flaming Poo. Yeah, go back, match those up so you can understand. Um, so welcome to the show where we review horror movies. And we usually do four of a similar type at a time. We just got done doing four remakes. Um, and boy, was that an adventure. We've done... C part twos, we've done anthologies, we've done a bunch of different ways, you know. And, and something we usually uh, try to steer away from because they're usually... Lesser. Lesser. Well, what we steer away from is if a movie is rated R and then they make a sequel or a spinoff that's PG-13... We go the opposite direction. Like, we get irritated because you shouldn't dumb it down to have kids be able to go. Like if they made a new Nightmare on Elm Street and it was PG-13, I would be angry. It'd be better than the last or one. Or maybe a prequel where he, you know, the story of him getting killed and everything. That, but That'd if they be did a it, cool story, not, not PG-13. PG but sometimes, like you liked The Haunting, which was PG-13. The Haunting was good. And we'll tell you how we felt about this. But uh, sometimes there are PG-13 horror movies worth watching. Um, and we're just going to go through four of them. Uh, we haven't determined which ones we're going to necessarily do in a row, but this is the first one, Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. Yeah. Not uh, to be confused with the podcast, Otis Jiry's Scary Stories Told in the Dark, which was inspired by the idea of these books, where he just reads short horror stories submitted by people. So if you haven't seen this, the basic stories is the, these friends in the olden days, the story 1968. That's, yeah, the story that's not one, one of, of the, the stories, stories is, is these kids, they break into go a, to a murder house. Yeah, they go to a house where this witch was known to have told stories to children that starred the children and then killed the children. Right. And then they find a book of her writings and they notice it's writing fresh stories about them as they're reading it. And those people, like each person gets their own story and, and they disappear or die or whatever. Right. And they have to try to figure out how to stop the witch from beyond the grave from killing them by telling them a story. That's... Pretty much the premise. Yeah. And that's the part that wasn't from the books. Right. Even though it's inspired by a set of three books. Anyway, um, so before we get into the behind the scenes and all that, why don't we show the people that trailer? What's that? It's her book of scary stories. Some people believe if we repeat stories often enough, they become real. They make us who we are. Mac, 
can be scary. Eat it, Harold. Do you want to see haunted house? Some kids went missing, so they boarded it up. Okay, we saw it. Can we go now? Who ordered the chicken? What's that? It's a book of scary stories. Tell me a story. Tommy's missing. Tommy's name was in the book. There's no way it's actually connected, right? Okay, what if what happens in the book is exactly what's happened for real? Oh my god. Andy! Stella! Listen, you're in the next story. We're reading it right here. It's a corpse looking for her missing toe. <laughs> I'm afraid that we woke something up. You shouldn't have taken the book. We've got to stop it. Sarah Bellows' book, where the stories write themselves and it all comes alive. The jangling man is coming. All right, well, since that does give away some big parts of the movie, I hate trailers that do that. I mean, they did it out of context enough, but there was one specific thing I was like, I hope they don't show that, and then it did show it. No. Yes. There's something I just said to you that right. I hope it doesn't show. And then it didn't it, show it that cut, part. Yes, it did. Were you watching the screen? It cut you away, know, showed something else, and then came back to show that. I hate right. trailers that give away ends of scenes that are important, or ends right. of movies in some cases. Right. I've seen that before, too. It didn't do that, but man. Um, it's supposed to be more of a tease to make you want to see it. I don't think they should give climactic scenes to the trailer people. Yeah, some people just, they give the whole movie to the trailer people and that's not right. Yeah, they should, or they should say, don't use this, this, and this. Right. These are twists and turns, or you know what I mean? That'd be like if the Sixth Sense, they were like it in the trailer. dead Bruce Willis Bruce in the Willis trailer. Bruce Willis is dead. It'd be like, okay, well, you just ruined all of it. Right, it's like, oh, the village takes oh, place now. Oh, by the way, uh, Sorry about that for, you know, spoiler alert for people who haven't seen. From what, the early 2000s? If they haven't seen it, they're not gonna. Probably not. Um, anyway, before we get into the behind the scenes stuff, of course, we have to. Give a shout out for to For those our... playing at home with the drinking game, we have to give a shout out to our real, real sponsors, sponsors that actually exist. Um, these, this is how we make our fat stacks of cash while producing a show for free. Yeah. These are real companies and that... keep the viewers at home alcoholics. <laughs> yeah, well... <laughs> um, this week, Gory Storytime is brought to you by Bastardized Books. Are you sick and tired of watching a movie and it's drastically different from the book? Do your friends and family annoy you with comments about how the book was way better? Not anymore, thanks to Bastardized Books. We take your favorite movies based on books and create a new novelization based on the film. Now the book has no changes from the film and is no better. The ba that's Bastardized Books. Coming soon, Bastardized Audiobooks. All right. Not too far-fetched. And by the Slightly Racist License. The Slightly Racist License grants you the, minor sl the use of minor slurs and comments under the condition that you are only using them in a way to denounce racism. For example, you can refer to Native Americans as Redskins as long as you say something like, the Redskins need to change their name because it's racist. 
That's the slightly racist like a racist <laughs> racist. <laughs> That's the slightly racist license from the makers of the N-word pass. All right. Anywho. <clears throat> Let's get some behind the scenes info. What do you think? Um, you go first. Yeah. The poster art is based on the story Harold, which is featured in the third book. Not this poster, I was gonna but say, the original poster. Which just had the, the Harold. scarecrow. Right. Yeah. Uh, the musical theme that plays throughout the film is called The Hearst Song, which is another story from the books. Yes. Uh, Ruth is the only character whose name corresponds with the character from the original story. Tommy is closer to for Harold, but the original farmer's name was Thomas. Uh, while Stella is first going through the book of stories, several stories from the Scary Stories book series can be seen, like The Cat's Paw. The Attic, and The Wendigo. Mm. The film, based on the Scary Stories to Tell the Dark book series, published in the 1980s, written... The film is based. Is based. Yeah. Okay. Uh, written by Alvin Schwartz and illustrated by Stephen... Stephen. Ga Stephen. 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 Yeah, there Gamble. we go. Uh, contortionist Troy James, who appeared on America's Got Talent, portrayed the jangly man. CGI enhanced the movements of his face, but he performed the movements walking backwards and crawling upside down himself. And it looked like it was so creepy, like you said, you just expected it to be fake. Like all CGI, and it wasn't. Right. Uh, the house used for the Bellows House is a mansion located in a small town called Petrolia in southern Ontario, Canada. Albinism is a double recessive generic trait, which means Sarah Bellows had to inherit it from both of her parents. Given its rarity and relatively small population of 19th century Pennsylvania, the twisted problems of the Bellows family may have included incest, though the marriage of first cousins at the time was not uncommon. Oh, that makes it all hey, you worse. meet women how you meet women. And you get not at the family reunion. Listen, that was kind of the joke. Uh, the next song, the song, the next song, yes. Well, the song that plays in the music box and at several other points in the film is actually You May Be Next, as stated by Lulu. Lulu. Okay. Uh, both okay. rhymes slash songs start off with the same few lines, though, and is easily confused with the Hearst song. The walkie-talkies the main characters use are Scout S. 025 transistor radios manufactured in Japan and powered by a 9 volt battery each tra uh, radio transceivers operated at 27 megahertz giving them nearly a 10 mile range trees houses and other obstructions would naturally decrease this range but they would easily reach across the neighborhoods of the characters so in other words they that's would, not a they fact really about work. the movie that's a fact about but they're saying it dark. would actually work right um the cover of the fame of Famous Creatures Magazine, a nod to Forrest, J. Ackerman's Famous Monsters of, of Filmland. Filmland. Filmland, which Ramon, uh, or Raymond, I don't know, Ramon. finds in Stella's room uh, is the same as that of an ace paperback weird story collection called The Macabre Reader. Reader, uh, edited by Donald A. Wolheim in 1959. In Stella's typewriter is a story called The Whistling Room, which credits herself as the author. However, the text below the title shows that it's a copy of William Hope Hodgson's tale of the same name, a part of the Karnacki, the Ghost Finder series. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, independent film producer John R. Blythe had early discussions with Al Alvin Schwartz estate in 09 on optioning the book rights for a feature of a film version. The monster's name is Jangly Man. Jangly is Hindu language for a word. It's an English Hindi language word for wild. I would have figured it's because his he was body kinda was kind of jangly. Kinda, yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, Austin Zajur and Dean Norris previously appeared together in Fist Fight. Okay. That. I don't think I've ever watched that movie. 
Fist fight was Ice Cube, ice cube and Charlie yeah. Day. Yeah, I, I, didn't, I liked it. I didn't watch it because it looked stupid to me. But <clears throat> anyway, the climax of the movie takes place on Tuesday, November 5th, 1968. That was the day former Vice President Richard M. Nixon beat the incumbent Vice President Hubert Humphrey. Uh, it was also, coincidentally, Guy Fox Day. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, in almost every frame of the movie, the color orange and or yellow is visible. The fictional Mill Valley, this is a spoiler section, uh, the fictional Mill Valley Town may be a reference to Downingtown, Pennsylvania, real, originally named Milltown. Downingtown was known for its abundant paper mills, and over the decades, the paper mill industry in the town faltered, much like the film. This would also make sense since Penhurst, the hospital Sarah Bellows is admitted to, is only a half hour drive from that town. Coincidentally, Downingtown is also the location of the classic monster flick, The Blob, from 1958. Oh, wow. Uh, some of the monsters seen in, this, in the film are actually from different stories. The drawing, the corpse looking for her toe was based on, is actually from a story about a haunted house. Well, the jangly man seems to be a mix of his own titled footsteps and from me, Ty, do, Ty, Ty, Walker. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, as he is initially a head that falls down the chimney and speaks the phrase before attaching other limbs, the only monsters who are from their own stories are the spiders, the pale lady, and Harold. There's a body count, it claims, but I actually tend to disagree, of five. And I'm not going to say the names that they have here, except for Jangly Man, apparently. It yeah, lists all right. Eh, but here's the thing. I mean, people disappearing or people being lost to the ether does not necessarily mean, mean dead. dead. I mean, I'm I mean, not going to give it away, right but now, the way the end yeah. is leaves it open for... Are they gone forever? We don't know. Sequel. It depends. Did they make enough money? Uh, oh, and Ramon, yeah. Stella, and Ruth are the only ones to survive their stories. Which so, is basically just undoing the part where I said I wasn't going to say what it said. So, um, whoops. Every character's scary story is directly related to their own fears. Tommy hates a scarecrow named Harold and ends up killing him. Jeez, they're giving away stuff. Augie frequently expresses concern about what's in the food we eat and ends up eating a toe. Ruth panics about spider webs touching her and she's driven mad by spiders. Eh, there's more to it than that. There's much more to it than that. But, you know, let's not ruin that for people because they should see this. That's crazy. Chuck yeah. specifically mentioned his nightmare about the Red Room and it came true in the hospital. Ramon feels like a coward for avoiding Vietnam and the monster that comes after him calls him a coward when he attacks. As for Stella, she seems to relate to Sarah as she too feels like she doesn't belong and in her story, she literally takes Sarah's place. Uh, the stories in the original book were adapted from old American folk tales. The Wendigo, for example, one of the stories whose title is seen in Sarah's book is a Native American legend. It refers to a vengeful spirit, not unlike Sarah herself. All right, and over on RottenTomatoes.com, they like to say positive and negative, have positive and negative reviews from people and from critics, critics and they uh, average it between one and 100%, and the people have it at 72% positive ratings. And the critics have it at a 78, which, which is not normal. No, uh, we've mentioned many times on this show, comedies and horrors tend to get hit the hardest by the critics, so the fact that this is a horror movie and it's dumbed down to PG-13 for content, and not dumbed down as in bad, but dumbed, like, well, and it wasn't woke. There was racism. But the point was, it was bad people that were racist. See, that's almost like they had that certificate to get away with slight oh. racism. Oh. That might have been something to do with that. But maybe not. Anyway, yeah, um, not. so what was your favorite scene or thing from the movie? Or do you want to do least first? Because it's harder when you like a movie. It is harder when you like a movie. Um... I'll go with least favorite first. So okay. least favorite, probably. The okay. Here's mine. Chuck 
right? The one who ends up getting messed with by the big lady mm -hmm. in the hall, right? He flashed to seeing like this dog and this old lady with like a like a thing, and yep. then that was not his story. Right. And it was like, why did he see it if it's not connected to him? Because that was before they stole the book, so what was happening wasn't from a story yet, because there was no book to have a story that they but had. But that's where he got the idea of the Red Room being him. So No. Yes. The Red Room was a nightmare he had had and had had for a while, oh. had nothing to do. That wasn't the red room. That was just- I mean, it was a red Sarah, room. Not really. It was a regular room in the house. It was Sarah and a dog staring at him when he opened the closet back up when he thought he was hiding in an old haunted house. He was, but- All right, I'm was, nitpicking anyway. It was great. And you were wrong. So, yeah. Um, my least favorite part had to be the fact that they didn't give enough service to the actual stories from the book that it was based on. They should have- they should have done it as an anthology. We've talked many times on the show about how we love anthology movies. Um, this really should have been an anthology movie. Uh, and it, it would have worked better. And I know it's gonna sound generic, but I, like I said to you, it should have been kids around a campfire. Each one tells one of the stories that they decide to pick and choose through for this movie. They had three books of short stories to do. Um, and then they could have just tied it together by having something happen to the people and have that wraparound story have something, you know, be its own story. But instead, they wrote a brand new script that had nothing to do with the books and then tried to work in the ending parts of a bunch of the stories from the books. Nah. Right. They, it ended up being okay. I like this movie, but it would have been better as far as an adaption of the book series to do it that way. Mm. Or they should have done a serialized TV show, you know, on an HBO or Showtime. It wouldn't have to be TVMA, but it could still, you know, get some of the blood in there that should have been in there. Um, and they should have had, like, each episode be its own thing, kind of like Tales from the Crypt did. What is your favorite part? Okay. Anyway. Uh, my favorite part, considering it's PG-13 and they were already tight on a budget because it was a CBS Films movie, mm -hmm. they did really good with the special effects. They did. I, I liked just about everything. And thank you for taking mine. I told you ahead of time that No, was... I told you that yesterday. No, I said that... You said you liked it too, but I said my favorite part is the fact well, that... Well, we share them the... sometimes, so look at that. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, he <laughs> basically, uh, yeah, the whole movie, like the bad guys, the special effects, they looked cool. They looked creepy. It was weird that Chuck's villain for his story did look like a like Mr. Potato Head and Samara from The Ring had a child. But you'll have that. <laughs> I mean, that's and what the character looks like. When you watch like. that, now that's all you're gonna see. Yes. Um, but what, so I, yeah, I would say definitely it had good special effects. Uh, what would you rate it on a scale of one to ten? I'm going a solid eight. I am. Eight. I'm gonna go seven, but only because I really was hoping for more of an anthology film. Because of the source material, it was more set up to be that. I didn't know there was gonna be so much of the movie that wasn't from the books at all. Oh yeah. The, the books didn't have a story about a vengeful witch that was actually innocent of a crime getting revenge on her family and then everybody else for accusing her of being a witch and bad. That, that's kind of... Mm. Mm. And that shouldn't have been the majority of this story, but it was. I don't know. I liked it. It fit. Anyway. But, uh, so yeah, on that side of the screen. You can watch this show on Fact TV Channel 8. No. No. Why do I keep saying that? Because you're used Fact to it for TV years. Fact TV Channel 1076. You Thir can, yeah. See it Thursdays at 8.30 and Fridays at 7 p.m. Email us at gorystorytime.com. At gorystorytime at yahoo.com. You can like us on Facebook. And by us, we mean the show and the channel. Fact TV has their own. And Gory Story Time has their own. And there's memes and other things that we share on that. And yep. 
You can also go to factdate.com. Watch a bunch of the back episodes of this and all the other stuff that they do on this channel. Um, and you can follow me on Twitter at Craig Jakes, all one word, all lowercase. And me at Jason T. Jakes, capital J, capital G, capital J. And, and that's about it, unless you have any, any last words you want to say about this movie. I mean, definitely go out and see this. Yeah, I would definitely recommend it. Yeah. Um, just don't expect it to be faithful exactly. to the stories. Right. Because it's, it's just not that movie. It's not. But it's good. But Definitely they they set up a sequel, and I do plan on watching it if they make it. So, yeah. Until next time, I'm your host, Jason. I'm his co-host and his father, Craig. And, and sweet, sweet dreams. dreams.